Brethren in Christ, Laudetu Jesus Christus in Secula. Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. Was he a villain or a hero? Was he a stubborn curmudgeon or St. Marcel the Moderate? Today on The Meaning of Catholic. Welcome to the Guild Family Stream. This is Timothy Flanders. And this is a show for Guild members. So the full show is available for Guild members only. Go to patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic to donate, become a Guild member, and get the full access to everything we've discussed. This particular broadcast, we, I have to record it just because of um, the family schedule today, get everything taken care of. But we'll have the live show later this week as well as a uh, just guild open discussion as well. There's been some pressing news lately, so we can talk about that as well. And we'll also have Mrs. Flanders on and the whole family uh, later on this week, all, all on the guild stream. So if you want access to the guild content, patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic. Um, this is where we've, we've been so far. Um, let me... Hmm focus okay that's what we want okay so here's what we've been doing so far in this whole series saint mar saint paul ii and saint marcel the moderate question mark uh so in our, our introduction we talked about the principles of christian judgment ecclesiastical judgment we have praise for both of these from great men of god from rasker to athanasius snyder part two is saint marcel the moderate doctor of the priesthood question mark and especially henry sears nuanced discussion of lefebvre and then we did two hours worth in parts three and four discussing John Paul II and the fact that he was not a phenomenologist. And this goes into a lot of big, important questions, which we'll discuss a little bit more today. Um, so we just introduced a lot of this stuff. Uh, and then parts five and six right now, what we have planned is we're going to first focus on uh, Marcel Lefebvre's virtues all the the positive things about him and um and then we'll just also discuss what i think are some excesses in his cat in his life and in his his work his ministry um and we're going to do the same for john paul too as well so uh the point of this is to try to get the the point is simply to get through the superficial caricature that gets passed around of both men there's a superficial caricature that's passed around about Lefebvre, and there's a, the, a superficial character passed around by John, about John Paul II. We're just trying to get past that. That's the whole purpose of this, and it requires a great deal of work, unfortunately. Um, but that's the situation. So that's the mission of Meaning of Catholic, uniting Catholics against the United of Holy Church. And so we're not trying to equate them and say they're both the same, or you know, that's up to the heavenly hierarchy. You know, if Marcel Lefebvre does become a saint. That would be up to the heavenly hierarchy, and I'm not in charge of that. So uh, I'm merely trying to get past these superficial caricatures because that's that's unfortunately is at the root of so much of the party spirit among Catholics, where we have, as St. Paul says, St. Paul says this very thing. He says, I follow Apollos, I follow Paul, and he condemns that attitude because we are Christians, we are Catholics, but, but unfortunately we have this mentality in the Catholic Church where you have, I follow Lefebvre, I follow John Paul. And we have this mentality, which is completely not Catholic. It's heretical to have that attitude. It's schismatic to have that attitude, whether you're a Lefebvreite or not. You can be schismatic against Lefebvre because schism, uh, schism is a lack of charity at, at its very root. So let's get into our uh, part five. Now, I don't know if we even get through part five in one hour, but because we first need to talk about a very, very extremely important aspect that we just kind of passingly got into. Uh, so today we'll talk about in, introduction is why was Aristotomism and Neoscholasticism inadequate to answer the Cartesian problem of modern philosophy? And this requires an hour, hours and hours of discussion, but we're just going to touch on it because this is going to be a critical piece for this whole debate because Archbishop Lefebvre is, is representing Aristotomism, Neoscholasticism, and John Paul II is representing the Wojtyla school of thought, very much the school of thought that was promoted by Vatican II uh, that we discussed on the last broadcast. And 
But once we get through that part, we're going to go, we're going to introduction to Lefebvre's moderation. And the problem is that it's not only the problem that we, we need this hours long treatment of this question is because it's not the superficial caricature is not merely in, uh, you know, just sort of Twitter. It's, it's, it's also, if you read the article about Archbishop Lefebvre in the New Catholic Encyclopedia, it's a, a woefully inadequate treatment of the man. And uh, I, would, I would dare say it's an injustice to the man. Um, and so I think that this caricature is still passed around, unfortunately, um, even in academic sources. You know, this is a serious academic source, New Catholic Encyclopedia. So that's the reason for the treatment that we're giving it here at Meaning of Catholic on the Guild stream. Okay, so... Why was Aristotomism inadequate? Now, this is something that we talked about a little bit more um, in discussions about Vatican II. Um, because coming from Eastern Orthodoxy myself, the Eastern tradition does not view Thomism as Roman Catholics view Thomism. Uh, Roman Catholics often view Thomism as sort of the end all be all. This is something that we discussed with one of the best Thomists out there, Matthew Minard. We discussed it on Meaning of Catholic on a show called No Salvation Outside Thomism. And what I think what Catholics need to understand, especially Catholics who are critical of Vatican II. And let me just say this. I, I wrote an entire book that has critical comments about Vatican II. And there's Vatican II is certainly open to a lot of criticisms. And we can discuss all those endlessly. That's fine. And I, I, I hold those views. But just because there are critical missteps in Vatican II, that does not, uh, you know, there are good things about Vatican II. There's, there, it's a mixed bag. It's a mixed council. It's a mixed bag. And ultimately, history will be the judge uh, because we're still very much in this same controversy. But one of the things that we can already see that's positive about Vatican II is its rebalancing of the Catholic, the truly Catholic and truly traditional uh, reception of Thomism and place of Thomism. Uh, St. Thomas is the angelic doctor, and he's also even more, he's the common doctor. He's sort of the plumb line against which we we judge all other philosophies and all other schools of thought. And that's the way it should be, because he is very much, he really, like no other, he, he breaks down this, this synthesis and breaks it down in a way that allows us to judge others in relation to it. However, that should not make it into a, uh, a dominating force. Thomism should not dominate the church. Some, Thomism should be the, the standard of the church, the standard for the big leagues. If you want to play in the big leagues, you have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Thomism. Well, guess what? There are other schools of thought that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Thomism. And namely in particular the eastern tradition the entire eastern tradition whether greek russian slavic uh, aramaic syriac coptic all of those traditions can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with thomism but the problem is that thomists themselves have disdained those other traditions and that is what has created this situation um and there's other western traditions that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with scobism or with uh, thomism namely scotism and suarism in particular but also this this Augustinian phenomenology as developed by the great men of the 20th century, uh, DJ Fred and Hildebrand, St. Teresa Benedicta Acruce, and St. John Paul II, of course, and the doctrines contained in Vatican II, um, which uh, bring out this Christian personalism, which is, it's merely an Augustinian phenomenological method, which is using the person to answer particular heresies that are happening in the 20th century, namely communism and liberalism. St. Thomas is inadequate to, to answer the problem of Cartesianism because Cartesian modern philosophy is what has created things like communism and liberalism. So St. Thomas happened centuries before, and so he is inadequate to deal with these problems, these modern problems. We need to augment St. Thomas, it, just like the Council of Trent had to be used to respond to Protestants. We couldn't just repeat, we couldn't just 
preached St. Thomas to the Protestants. That was inadequate. We had to add the Council of Trent to St. Thomas. And so that's we need to understand that. And there's there's modern issues that need to be resolved. This is the, the problem with Cartesianism, as I show here in this this outline. Cartesianism is Cartesianism. Again, that's that's uh, Rene Descartes. I think, therefore, I am. It's essentially stranding realistic philosophy, stranding it within strangling it within the subjective. And it, so it's it's an anti-realistic philosophy, which loses the realistic the connection with reality. And as we discussed in the very first uh, two, two shows ago, the church can only accept realistic philosophy. The church can must reject all forms of philosophy which are not realistic. But that leaves Aristotle and Plato. Both of them are realistic, but they use different methodologies. Okay. So insofar as Cartesianism is anti-realistic, it's intrinsically evil. It must be rejected completely. Every form of Cartesianism, which is anti-realistic, must be rejected. But insofar it is, as it is Platonic, in terms of utilizing the subjective, there is a reality of the subjective. The experience of truth is a real thing that needs to be taken into account when we discuss reality. What you experience subjectively of the truth must be taken into account. And so insofar as it is merely saying that, we can abs that can be an absolutized aspect, as we discussed from Carol Wojtyla's Person and Act. It absolutizes an aspect. It absolutizes the subjective, which is wrong. But we can't deny the subjective as a result. It's merely a heresy. It's a half-truth. So in order to combat the heresy, we got to bring in the other side of that truth, which is the objective outside your subjective. Now, why here's let me let me give you a very um a few more um with with letters b and d here which which put this matter more acutely aristotomism is what created the novus ordo because essentially it's what it's doing is it's negating the experience of god in the liturgy it's saying that the worshiper when he experiences God in worship, that is not that important. What's important is the fact that we have form and matter of the sacrament. That is an Aristotomist way of thinking. Now, in fairness to St. Thomas, I think St. Thomas would, would also reject that type of thinking. But this is the type of thinking that had developed in the 19th century and the 20th century. Nevertheless, there was a reductionism. And that's what you do when you when you absolutize the objective, when you're so, sort of excessively objectivizing everything, you want to reduce everything down to a little system where we can reduce everything to its principal parts. And there's, there's, a, there's an important use for that, a very important use for that. We need to have that, that type of thinking. It's important to have that because we do need to reduce the sacraments to their principal parts because we have to have valid sacraments. So, the reductionism has a use, which is what is the bare minimum? That's really the, that's kind of the question that's being answered there. What is the bare minimum of the sacraments? Well, it's the valid form and matter. But Augustinian phenomenology says not what is the bare minimum, but what is the fitting response to Almighty God? Injustice the fitting response to Almighty God, which includes all of these sort of subjective experiences of God, which we gain from all the different smells and bells of the liturgy, is sort of maximalizes our response to God. Because there is never, because the experience of Almighty God, again, that's the thing that should be taken into account here a little bit. The experience of Almighty God, when Isaiah sees the vision and he said and the the cherubim and the seraphim say holy 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 he falls down in worship and that that experience right there is an essential part of the liturgy but not if you have an aristotomist reductionism you're not going to come to that conclusion so this is just one example of why is this inadequate why isn't it inadequate now it would be one thing if thomism were merely the standard and a standard among other school of thoughts and they were all debating with each other. But the problem is that in 19th and 20th century, up until Vatican II, 
there was an absolutizing and a dominating Thomism, where there was this sort of de facto church politics of no salvation outside Thomism. And that's what caused the reaction of Vatican II. And that's what trads need to understand, especially because sometimes trads, we think that, you know, all these problems, you know, church was doing great before Vatican II, but that's not true. Um, there were lots of great things, but this is this is the main issue that the theologians uh, at Vatican II, were, those like the Parity, like Ratzinger, they were reacting against this. Now, the other aspect, which we'll get into more and more as we discuss Lefebvre and John Paul II, is the neo-scholastic reductionism of Trent's teaching on matrimony. This is where it becomes also very acute because this, this is something that affects many of us who are married, um, which is where, again, it's asking the question, what makes a valid marriage? Uh, and, and that's when we get the canonical definition of matrimony, which is the exchange of bodily rights, the consent, uh, these, these, these frames, the, the two ends of marriage, marriage is uh, the telos of marriage is, is the propagation of children. Um, but when you have an excessive amount of Thomism that's dominating every other school of thought, you have this reduction of Trent's teaching on matrimony into this very objectivizing thing. In other words, the subjective experience of love, of spousal love, is negated, which is against the Council of Trent. Go back and read the Council of Trent on matrimony, and you see that he, it has a, the full picture of matrimony. But when you have this neo-scholastic reductionism of marriage, it sort of excessively objectivizes everything so that uh, marriage becomes reduced to its bare minimum. Now, again, there's a use for that. We have to know what the bare minimum of valid marriage is because we have to have valid marriages. That's important. But at the same time, we we can't minimize. It's the same thing with the liturgy. It's very it's very similar, even in even on the spiritual level, the liturgy and marriage, uh, because obviously the the faithful and nave represent the bride of Christ, and the and the priest is is the bridegroom, obviously. So there's a spousal aspect to liturgy, and there's a spousal aspect to marriage, and so um, we can't minimize the liturgy. We can when we're trying to figure out what is valid. That's important. We have to minimize and reduce it to as principal parts. And we have to do the same for marriage. But the issue here is that there was this imbalance. And so Vatican II is trying to correct that imbalance. Obviously, Vatican II did this did this balancing imperfectly, to say the least. There's lots of issues with Vatican II. We don't have time to get into all those. We will in, in the future. But the point is, what we're trying to get at here is that there were actually issues before Vatican II that we needed to deal with. Now, Let's get into Lefebvre. We spent 18 minutes doing this introduction, but it was very important because somebody had brought this up and I wanted to get more into that. And we will get into all these things in much more detail um, in, in the coming broadcast. Okay, so 18 minutes. That's the end of our public portion. So if you want the full treatment with Lefebvre and everything, you do have to become a Guild member, patreon.com slash slash meaning of Catholic. As always, if you can't afford it, just contact me uh meaning of catholic.com slash contact if you cannot afford to be a guild member you can always join for free 